I thought, I thought I would start off with a, a quotation from a, a man who is certainly an expert uh, in something, George Bush. <laughs> uh, now I, I came across this, and not too many things that he says strike me in any way, but th this did. Maybe strike, lower. what's that? You're getting lower. I'm getting lower. Be that's because I was thinking of him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting more depressed by the second. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. But uh, he, s he said this uh, sometime during the, the 1988 campaign. And uh, he said, in my view, there is no place in American public life for philosophies that divide American, <coughs> Americans from one another on class lines <laughs> and that excite conflict among them. Oh, so, th yeah, I mean, that interested me. <laughs> uh, because I thought, well, is it philosophies that divide people along class lines? and excite conflict among them. I mean, that's always the, uh, that's been said for a long time. That is, it's not reality, it can't be reality. It can't be that that's the way the world is. It can't be that that's the way America is. No, it must be that some people are going around with philosophies that introduce this into people's minds, have to tell people that there is a class society here, and that there is class conflict here. Well, I suppose it's possible to, to think it's philosophies. It's possible to ignore that reality uh, if you were born yesterday, uh, if you have you know, no sense of history, or if you have the sense of history that you got from going to school and, and reading all the orthodox texts. Or you get your sense of reality from the seven o'clock news or from, you know, the press. You know, it's possible, just possible to ignore that. Um, I found it hard uh, to ignore that, even though I, I suppose I learned my history originally from those same orthodox texts. I went to, s to school like uh, most Americans went to school and learned what most Americans learned and, and what most Americans still learn uh, about American history. And, and what they learn is, is mostly uh, about, about something uh, glorious, triumphant, uh, the march of democracy. In fact, if you look at the titles of books, you, you know, you say, Legacy of Freedom. Some, uh, somebody showed me a, a book that's used in, in high schools around the country. Legacy of Freedom, the American Pageant, you know. uh, and you know, I'm, I'm really, that's what the titles are all about. Uh, you don't see any titles uh, like the sad story of, of American history. <laughs> uh, no, you. Uh, so there, there are all, all these uh, books that that talk about the, uh, the march of democracy and the march of progress. And uh, here's, here's a, something from this book, The Legacy of Freedom, the, which is a, a book for young people uh, who are going to school and, and it's pr maybe one of their first serious history courses. And, and this book starts out with an introduction telling young people uh, what they are going to learn in, in this history text. And it says, uh, legacy of freedom will aid you in, there were about four authors to this. You know, they took turns writing each word <laughs> and so that none of them would know what was finally being said. Because uh, if they were people of conscience, that would be the only way to have them write this. Uh, and legacy of freedom will aid you in understanding the economic growth and development of our country. The book presents the developments and benefits of our country's free enterprise economic system. 
uh, you will read about the various ways that American business, industry, and agriculture have used scientific and technological advances to further the American free market system. That system allows businesses to generate profits while providing consumers with a variety of quality products <laughs> from which to choose in the marketplace, thus enabling our people to enjoy a high standard of living. Well, uh, and then that same book, I mean, that's a good, fair, accurate introduction, isn't it, uh, to uh, the history of the United States and the, and the American system. And obviously the people who are going around now saying, well, you see, look, what, look, what, look what's happened to Eastern Europe, look what's happened to the, the, these countries that took a different path, and now we, we've got to get them back on the path of free enterprise and the, and the market system. And, and these people were brought up on uh, you know, this kind of the textbook, or these people helped write this kind of textbook. But another, another thing, uh, legacy of freedom will aid you in understanding our country's involvement in foreign affairs, <laughs> including our role in international conflicts <laughs> and in peaceful and cooperative efforts of many kinds in many places. <laughs> I mean, they're certainly right about the many places. <laughs> you know. But it's not, it's not just on the level of uh, history texts for students that this is done, that a certain kind of history is presented which exalts in, in our system, uh, our superior system, and the wonders of it. Uh, and, uh, in the, among the professionals, now you, you would think that, well, this maybe for high school kids, yes. But as, as historians get more sophisticated, as historians get up into the higher realms, as they go to graduate school, as they get PhDs. Notice how my voice is becoming more reverent by the moment. Uh, as uh, we go, go to meetings of the American Historical Association. Has anybody here ever been to a meeting with the American Historical Association? Yes, I do recognize you. <laughs> no, I'm joking. The, uh, I, actually, I didn't expect even one person I'm really, to have been there and now I'm a little suspicious. <laughs> but you know what I mean about meetings of the American Historical Association. But one of these meetings is addressed by a president of the American Historical Association. You can't get higher in, in the summit of, of historical professionalism right than the president of the American Historical Association. And he, he was uh, addressing the, his fellow historians and saying, uh, about history and how history should be taught and how history, history should be written. Too much self-criticism is weakening to a people. <laughs> a great people's culture begins to decay when it commences to examine itself. <laughs> <laughs> we have been losing sight of our national purpose our military preparedness held back by insidious strikes for less work and more pay. Uh, well, this was, I, I should give the date so it's not fair, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. 1941. 1941. Uh, yes. Right. Uh, so you can sort of, you know, almost understand it <laughs> if you try hard. And in fact, it was, you know, uh, around the same time that uh, the historian Samuel Eliot Morrison, one, again, uh, somebody at the summit of the profession, uh, said that he thought that historians you know, should not take sides. They should 
you know, well, you know the whole business. Being objective, present things, as he put it, simply explain the event exactly as it happened. <laughs> I like the word simply. Is <laughs> if it's simple to explain exactly what happened. And then he says in the same essay, uh, which is called The Faith of a Historian, uh, he criticized those historians who expressed disillusionment with World War I, because there were. There were a lot of people who expressed disillusionment with World War I, including historians. Uh, and uh, he says, historians, uh, these people rendered the generation of youth which came to maturity around 1940, spiritually unprepared for the war they had to fight. Historians are the ones who should have pointed out that war does accomplish something, that war is better than servitude. Uh, so on the one hand, he says, yeah, hi historians should be neutral. On the other hand, <laughs> history should prepare people, young people, for the benefits of war. Now, he wasn't saying all wars, right? He was talking in a particular historical period. But still, he, he certainly was indicating that historians have a job to do, and he, he knew what that job was. When the, in the McCarthy period in the, in the 50s, which of course is not the only period in which we've had McCarthyism, it's just that happens to be a, a period in which we had a name to attach <laughs> to the period. Uh, and so uh, in, that, in that period when they were calling up uh, people, uh, a few historians got nervous about being called up before the House on American Activities Committee. And some of them appeared before the committee to assure the committee that they were not that kind of historian, the wrong kind of historian. The historian who examines us too carefully, who is too self-critical, one of these, Daniel Burstein, who later became li uh, Librarian of Congress. Uh, and uh, he appeared before the House on American Activities Committee, and he assured them that while he had been, you know, connected with communists at one time, he was now okay. And, and he, he would, the way he would show how different he was now is the way he would teach history. And uh, he would do it in two ways. First by, as he put it, by participating in religious activities at the University of Chicago. Uh, committee like that. And the second form of my opposition has been to attempt to discover and explain to students in my teaching and in my writing the unique virtues of American democracy. Uh, anyway, all of this is simply to say that the idea of presenting uh, the history of the United States sort of, uh, as a long march of virtue you know, is something that has dominated American culture and dominated you know, the, the teaching of American history. And a part of it has been that which the quote from Bush refers to. Uh, part of this orthodox teaching has been the teaching that uh, if there's class conflict, it can only be because some philosophers have, have stimulated it. If there's an, an understanding of class differences in the United States, is a because people have spread the idea of class differences. Uh, well, I, I read these same books, and, I, and, and as I say, and, and, and took those same courses and, and so on. But I suppose at a certain point in my life, I began to veer off uh, in this peculiar direction in which I've been going ever since. Uh, and I suppose I. I you know, I, I guess this happens a lot. People get away from that acculturation, those texts, that inundation of ideas in the culture, 
and they begin to, to look very sharply at the reality around them, or to think very uh, deeply about uh, what they themselves are experiencing. And so uh, I, I guess I had uh, experiences in my life which made me uh, begin to question what I had read in history books about war, about class conflict, uh, about the race question, uh, about lots of things. Uh, at the age of 18, I, instead of uh, going to college, I went to work in the shipyard. I say instead of going to college as if I had a choice, uh, I d decided as a sociological experiment. <laughs> Uh, to work, yes. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I, I spent three years working in a shipyard and uh, experienced, well, that reality, as so many people do, the re simply the reality of work, the reality of, of industrial work, the reality of hard work, the reality of, of working in, uh, in conditions of cold and heat and bad smells and... Uh, boredom and uh, work, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then I enlisted in the Air Force and I became a, a bombardier in the Air Force and I, I flew bombing missions uh, in World War II. I guess I should say which war I was in so that people won't think it was the Spanish-American War. <laughs> uh, but, uh, And I knocked around in various jobs and uh, worked in a warehouse and ditch digger and brewery worker and then decided to do nice work, get myself a, a nice job, go to school, study history, which I did under the GI Bill. So by the time I began to study history in this sort of semi-professional way that's going through the whole history, uh, I, I already had a set of ideas, I already had a set of experiences, and, uh, and I, I knew enough uh, as, I, as I began to read the books that were given to me in undergraduate and graduate school and, uh, uh, and saw that they weren't significantly different from the books I'd gotten in junior high school. <laughs> You know, that I, I discovered that, that you, very often you get in graduate school the same viewpoint, only a little more flesh. I mean, what's the point of, of fleshing out a bad <laughs> viewpoint? But uh, uh, that graduate school simply repeated uh, the, the fundamental biases of a junior high school on a more sophisticated level and with more complex language. And so I, in order to, uh, to learn something from, about things that I thought were missing from my books, I had to go outside the classroom and I had to read uh, things of my own. Because, and I, I began with labor history uh, because I, well, I, I just uh, got interested in labor history. I was, I'd been brought up in a working class community and, I, and I'd been in a, a, a couple of unions and, uh, and I was interested that the things I began to read about on my own didn't appear in my, in my books. Uh, uh, I didn't see Big Bill Haywood in these texts. I didn't see the IWW. I didn't see Mother Jones. I didn't see Emma Goldman. Uh, uh, the, you know, the, the few, few quick flashes of, of oh, well, was, I think there were a few lines on the Pullman strike of 1894, you see. Uh, Nothing about the Ludlow Massacre, nothing about the Colorado Coal Strike of 1913, 1914, nothing about the Lawrence Textile Strike of 1912. I mean, nothing about the thousands of labor struggles that people in this country have engaged in, you know, all, all through our history. From, from the earliest time, from the early 19th century, from the organization of, of the, uh, the mill girls in, in Lowell, and the Lowell Factory Association and, and the uh, protests and the strikes, uh, nothing about that. And so I, uh, I had to read on my own very often. Uh, well, they were you know, not the kind of things that, that people would assign in courses, uh, but it gave me new viewpoints. I read Howard Fast's books, The Last Frontier, and, uh, and, and realized there's a, a it's possible to have a different viewpoint on the Indians than the one that came across in history courses uh, 
you know, where you knew about Custer's Last Stand and about two other little things, uh, and, and that, that was it. Uh, you weren't told that during uh, the Civil War, the Great War for Freedom, one of the great massacres of Indians took place uh, out in Colorado. Uh, I, uh, I read Fast's novel on the... Uh, I read Fast's novel, the, the American, about the Haymarket Affair. Again, I, I hadn't, there hadn't been anything on a Haymarket Affair, all through graduate school. Uh, this, this was a revelation, this was exciting. Uh, uh, an amazing event, uh, one of those events that, that uh, deeply affects the people who live through it and know about it. Later I learned that, that Emma Goldman, as a young girl factory worker uh, in Rochester, New York, uh, that uh, she was propelled into a certain kind of political consciousness by the, by the fact that the Haymarket Affair uh, had just taken place and, and that she learned of the execution of uh, the four anarchists who were, were arrested in the Haymarket Affair, although there was no evidence uh, against them that they had done anything except the fact that they were anarchists. Uh, so I began to, to read on my own, to read Upton Sinclair, and to learn not only about the stock yards and, and the fact that the, the, the profit motive seemed to lead industrialists to uh, put up with the most horrendous conditions and subject their workers uh, to uh, the most brutal of situations in order to make more money. And not only did I learn about that by reading Upton Sinclair, but uh, uh, learned about socialism, learned about the ideas of socialism. Uh, I read Marx. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> I mustn't say that. <laughs> Marx is dead. <laughs> Marxism is dead. You know, right? It's all gone. Oh. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's what we're hearing, right? You know, I, I began reading this in the papers recently. You know, since, since the Soviet Union has collapsed, Marx is dead. As if the Soviet Union represented Marx, you know. As if any place in the world has yet represented Marx. Uh, no. So I, I moved the books, the Marx books on my shelf, from one place to another to keep the authorities guessing. <laughs> But I, I read Marx, uh, and uh, Marx, Marx said that history is the history of class struggle. And, and everything I read in American history suggested that this was true. Uh, uh, you know, t today I was on this uh, radio program, this uh, NPR radio program about history, and the guy who uh, was my host uh, the host of the program, whatever, uh, said something about, well, you know, there are these two schools of thought about history, and one of them, that history is this, just this placid running on of events, and then there's the Marxian thought that history is a history of struggle. So, you mean only Marx? <laughs> if you think that history consists of struggle, that you must be a Marxist, you know? What about James Madison, who said that society consists of factions based on property? And Madison was saying this, well, you know, when Madison, in the 1780s, Marx was not born. You might say, no, we're not Marxists, we're Madisonians. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Swear, you know, are you now or have you ever been a Madisonian? <laughs> you know, uh, well, you know, I read Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath, uh, and uh, and learned, uh, you know, thought about and connected that with what I had learned about the the populist movement and the, the plight of farmers. Uh, all through American history on farm workers, and farmers without land, farmers who are wage laborers, uh, farmers who come from uh, other countries and are exploited, exploited, exploited. Uh, 
and uh, so I read I read outside the classroom uh, and and you know more and more sort of developed uh, uh, ideas about what what was missing from from history and uh, and then I began to do my own research, uh, since I was now a, a so-called professional historian, uh, and uh, I, 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 was, I was supposed to do things like that. And well, I had been interested in the Ludlow Massacre, that which was, as I say, missing from my uh, textbooks. How many here, people here have heard of the Ludlow Massacre? How many people here have not heard of the Ludlow Massacre? And there are a number of people here who have neither heard nor not heard <laughs> of the Ludlow Massacre. It's like abstain. <laughs> but uh, I mean, those of you who know about it uh, know that it's a remarkably dramatic and important event in, in American, not just American labor history, in American history, you know, a strike of miners uh, against, uh, in 1913, 1914, in southern Colorado, against the uh, Rockefeller uh, coal mines, and, and uh, uh, long, bitter, uh, violent, uh, dramatic strike, uh, the kind of event which Hollywood w would make a movie of if one it had any intelligence, and two, if, it's the, <laughs> if it had that kind of commitment, uh, and, and three, if it would be allowed to, you see. Uh, but um, it was an, an incident like so many incidents, which uh, in a nutshell uh, uh, bring together all the strands of a society and show you the role of the state, the role of the press, the existence of class conflict, the way the employer tries to divide workers from one another because of working in the mines were people of all nationalities uh, uh, and Mexicans and Scotsmen and Bulgarians and, and Greeks and blacks and, uh, but who came together uh, in this way, came together in this remarkable way. And the, the connections between the political power and economic power, the buying off of the National Guard by John D. Rockefeller and the final attack by the National Guard on the miners' tent colony and the burning of their tents and the, the deaths of these uh, 11 children and two women in, in the fire that engulfed these tents, which uh, came to be known as the Ludlow Massacre, about which Woody Guthrie wrote a, a remarkable song, which some of you might have heard. Uh, but... Uh, I worked uh, for a while on, on, on the, the uh, congressional career of Fiorello LaGuardia, and, uh, who, was, who was before he was a mayor and before he was an airfield. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I, I say, well, LaGuardia, and I, people say, oh, yes, the airfield. <laughs> it's dangerous to ha you know, have an airfield named after you. People forget you. And remember the airfield. Uh, but he was before, he was an airfield, he was the mayor of New York. Before he was the mayor of New York, he was a congressman from East Harlem in the 1920s. And I, I, I read, the, and I was interested in the 1920s. Well, 1920s was the jazz age, the age of prosperity. It was a great time. As I had, you know, that's what the history books said. They still say that. Uh, <laughs> Because, you know, if you take that, those periods which they call depression and they then take those periods which are a little better than them, those periods look like prosperity. <laughs> and so this, this was an age of prosperity. It was interesting to me to read the letters that LaGuardia received. And by the way, he was a, a radical congressman. Uh, I, I say that very carefully. I mean, how often do you have a radical congressman? Uh, we have one here. What's that? We have one here. We have one here. Yeah. Ron Dellums? Yeah. Well, not exactly here, but close. Not close. Yeah. Well, that's close enough. Well, we'll take, 
we'll take him. <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> anyway, uh, LaGuardia was a radical congressman. He, he ran one year on both the Republican and the Socialist tickets. Uh, but he, he protested the sending of Marines to, to Nicaragua by Calvin Coolidge. Nobody, people thought Calvin Coolidge never did anything. It's not true. He sent the Marines to Nicaragua. LaGuardia protested against this. But more than that, LaGuardia protested against what the working people in his district were going through in this age of prosperity. And if you read the letters that the people in his district were sending to him in the jazz age, you know, the letters were full of, you know, I can't feed my family. I can't feed my children. I can't pay for the doctor. I can't pay to have, to get, to have gas for cooking. Uh, my husband is out of work. And when I looked into this and I saw all around the country there were these great pockets of, of poverty and desperation in this age of prosperity. And one of the things that taught me, uh, aside from teaching me that uh, you have to be very careful uh, about uh, characterizing the uh, state of a nation by the state of its upper class, uh, the state of the economy by the, uh, the stock market, as people today judge the state of the economy by the Dow Jones average. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me, uh, you know, no matter what the news is, however the news changes from day to day, one thing you can always be sure of, they're going to tell you what the Dow Jones average is. And it's, it, it's as if, you know, this will tell you whether we are okay or not okay, well off or not well off. And they don't tell you what the unemployment figures are. They don't tell you what the infant mortality rate is today. They don't tell you how many people died in emergency wards today. No, they tell you what the Dow Jones average is today, and they infect the whole population with the notion that the measure of prosperity in the United States is the Dow Jones average. I began to think about that at that time. I also began to think about the labels of periods, the jazz age. And then I, I took a look at the progressive period. For those of you who have studied American history, there's always a period called the progressive era. Well, I, I thought actually it was a sort of dangerous for them to say that, because it suggested that the other eras were not progressive. <laughs> but you don't want people to think of that. But the progressive era was the, the early years of the 20th century. Why was it called the progressive era? Well, it, the textbooks made it clear. It was a time, those first 15, 16, 20 years of the, of the 20th century, a time when certain reform laws were passed by Congress. And, you know, and the amendments, you know, the income, 16, 17, the income tax amendment, popular election of senators, the Federal Trade Commission set up, the Federal Reserve Board set up, hours of railroad workers regulated, the Meat Inspection Act, notice how good our meat is these days, uh, the Meat Inspection Act. Uh, so, so it's the age of prosperity. It's, the, it's a progressive era, the progressive era. And then I, I learned, you know, that this, uh, when I began to do more work in black history, I guess some of this came out of the fact that my, my, my first real teaching job, I had a few unreal teaching jobs, <laughs> my first real teaching job was in the South, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I taught in a, in a black women's college in Atlanta called Spelman College. Uh, and you know Spelman College? Yeah. You heard of it, that's good. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I was there during the years of the Civil Rights Movement and, and got involved in the movement at that time. And, um, and I, I looked around and I saw that uh, in this Negro college, as it was called at that time, in this women's Negro college, there was no course on Negro history. There was a required course, a required one-year course in the history of England. <laughs> really? Yeah. But it tells you, you know, the, how the, the culture dominates uh, e even the, the, the people who are uh, 
have the least reason to accept this, but it, you go to college and these are the courses. I became interested in doing more and more in black history and, and, uh, and one sort of simple thing I learned was that in the progressive era, in exactly those, era, those years called the progressive era, those were the years in which the largest number of black people were lynched in the South and also in the North. Uh, thousands and thousands of, of black people executed uh, with the uh, state governments looking on and, this should be noted, with the federal government looking on. This is very often ignored, the fact, you know, the thought as well as, sure, this happened in the South. The federal government is complicit in all this. Uh, because the federal government, ever since the Civil War, had the right to interfere with this and didn't. Had a legal right, constitutional right, constitutional responsibility to stop this and did not. You see. Well, uh, so I, I, beca I became suspicious of labels, labels of eras and, and, and names that are given to, to deflect people from understanding situations, you know. Operation Rolling Thunder, and if you remember that, during the Vietnam War, that was what our intense bombing of Vietnam was called. Operation Rolling Thunder, just a natural phenomenon. <coughs> like say. Desert Storm. Like Desert Storm is another natural phenomenon, right. Uh, well, uh, so it became clear to me the more I read and, and the, the more, uh, the, the more uh, history I read on my own that no, it isn't philosophies that cause people to think that there is a class system in the United States. Uh, there, there is a reality of class from the very beginning of American history. Uh, uh, if, you, if, if, if you go right all the way back to the colonial period, you find you know, they weren't all founding fathers. Uh, they weren't all founding fathers and, and a few sons of liberty. Uh, at the time of the American Revolution, uh, one-fifth of the population, 20% of the population, consisted of black slaves uh, who were the, the heart of the agricultural working class of the revolutionary period. Uh, half of the people who came to these shores in the 17th and 18th centuries up to the American Revolution came as servants. And very few of them moved up into uh, the middle or upper classes. Uh, most of them, even when they got out of uh, the position of being a servant, which was almost like being a slave, but of course not quite, uh, they moved into positions of being uh, uh, laborers or workers or landless farmers. Some of them small farmers, but they didn't move up very far. This was a class society right from the beginning, where uh, uh, a, f a few people started out with enormous quantities of land. They hadn't worked for it. Uh, they didn't gain it from s the hard sweat of the people say, well, you know, well, maybe I, I, I didn't earn this enormous sum of money that I have, but my grandfather did. Uh, well, if you, if you trace the grandfathers back and back and back, you'll see. No, people didn't start off even, and then those people with great talent and great energy and great initiative and so on uh, became uh, multimillionaires. Uh, it didn't happen that way. No, it started off with a few people give, being given huge la grants of land, uh, millions of acres of land given away, you know. Uh, One-sixth of New York State given away to one man by the governor of New York, who was a friend, <laughs> a friendly act. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a class society in the colonial period. And then there were uprisings and rebellions, not just slave rebellions, uh, which there were six major slave uprisings in the colonial and revolutionary period, uh, but 18 major uprisings against state governments. The American Revolution was not a, a revolution of a united community rising patriotically uh, against England. The American Revolution was a, a revolution of a society torn by class conflict, 
of rich and poor, of poor people suspicious of the founding fathers, suspicious of the leaders of the revolution, deserting from the army, uh, uh, refusing to fight, having to be cajoled, having to be threatened, uh, needing George Washington to send Nathaniel Green down into the South uh, with orders to, to kill some uh, future uh, soldiers as examples to induce the rest of them to join uh, the Continental Army. Uh, it was uh, a society ridden with, with conflict between rich and poor. Uh, when, when, the, uh, when they announced the, the conscription of people in the, uh, for, the, for the American Revolution in, in, in Boston, the, the arrangement was that the rich could pay their way out of the, this conscription. A lot of people know that this took place in the Civil War. It also took place on, on the state level, on the colonial level, in the Revolutionary War. Uh, and, uh, and there was a, a protest demonstration in Boston against this. Uh, there were... Um, the, the Revolution, the war against England, uh, put a blanket over the visibility of that class conflict, as wars do, and as wars very often are intended to do. Uh, you find, if, if, you, if you look at the history of, of, of wars, that uh, wars seem to take place at a time when it might be dangerous not to have a war. <laughs> or as George Orwell said, uh, he said, wars are fundamentally internal policies. Oh, wars are fought in, in order con to control the population at home. Uh, so the, the, the reality was class conflict in the colonial and revolutionary period. The reality of the Constitution was uh, that it was an, an elite class that, that got together and, and in Philadelphia and formed the Constitution. And that class conflict uh, continued all through, all through the 19th century. Uh, and that march of uh, industrial progress that took place after the Civil War, because I remember when I was going to school and, and, and learning how uh, this was the great heyday of the American economic system. That period between the Civil War and World War I was a period in which the United States became a great industrial power. It was a period in which, uh, and the heroes were Rockefeller and Morgan and Carnegie and Mellon, the, the, and the, the, the captains of industry. And they, they built up our, our country, and they, the railroads spanned the continent, and the oil refineries grew, and so a one, it was a wonderful story. Uh, a story of, of, of enormous success. And what was left out of this, that story was the human cost of that industrialization. It's interesting to me that, uh, that I can imagine somebody in Russia was talking about the Stalin period saying that, that's the period in which Russia became a great industrial power. True, you know, but they, you know, that's what history is, partial truths, uh, and that's not enough. Yes, it's true, but what about the human cost of that industrial development? It's easy for us to see it in relation to the Soviet Union. It's always easy for us to see things somewhere else, harder for us to see it here harder for us to see that this uh, magnificent economic system, <coughs> well, the word magnificent, of course, is, is based on the Dow Jones average. <laughs> but this magnificent economic system uh, was created at enormous human cost and continues to, to exist at enormous human cost. That the, the, the Transcontinental Railroad was not this romantic meeting of these I remember the movie was made called Union Pacific. Any of you remember that? You, re you saw it. Yeah, the Do you remember what a nice movie it was? <laughs> well, we won't say, talk about that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, there was, you know, there was the Central Pacific and there was the Union Pacific, 
and it was very exciting. And there was a man, and there was a woman. This is how Hollywood does things, right? <laughs> you know, there's uh, this, this and that, and he and she, and they all come together at the same time, <laughs> you see. Uh, and, uh, and the golden spike is driven in, right? They didn't mean that. <laughs> but, that uh, but I remember learning, you know, I'm learning in junior high school what a great day it was. Oh, thank you. That golden spike was driven in. And so it, it was a great achievement. And I remember learning that in school and feeling great pride about, about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And it was only years later that I learned. And when you learn these things, you always feel stupid. Because you think, now, surely I should have figured that out before. Right? I should have asked the, a question about that. I shouldn't have just let that slide to learn, you know, who worked on that railroad? Who died working on that railroad? The thousands of Chinese laborers and Irish laborers who worked on that railroad, who worked themselves to death, who, work, who were worked to death on that railroad, who worked long, long hours in bitter, bitter cold, who got sick and who died, and who were just thrown away ruthlessly by the railroads, and more immigrants brought in to work on the railroads. Uh, uh, that was behind the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, and nothing, nothing in the books about, about who worked in those uh, steel mills, and under what conditions they worked, and how many died uh, working in those steel mills. Those are very dangerous jobs, working in steel mills, working in foundries, working on the railroads. Uh, at the time that J.P. Morgan uh, announced the consolidation of railroads in the United States, he was a great consolidator. Yeah. Uh, 2,000 people were, being, were dying every year in accidents on the railroad. Industrial accidents in this country have exceeded the deaths in war. But you don't, you don't see that as part of the story. In the year 1914, one year, 35,000 people were killed on the job. And hundreds of thousands injured on the job. There's a, a human toll of injury and suffering and pain, of lost limbs, of lost fingers, of lost legs, of people crushed uh, in industrial work. Uh, that's, that's part of the cost of, of this, this great economic progress that we've been through. And, this is, and the point of this is, is not simply to correct the historical record, although not simply to, as Morrison suggested, just let tell the facts as they are. Uh, but the importance of this is that it, it's all suggestive about something today. You know. it's, it's suggestive about uh, the fact that we have to look t twice at three times at progress, at what is called progress, at technological progress, at going to the moon, uh, at building spaceships, at anything that's, that's presented as, well, this is a wonderful thing because it, it, it's, a, it's, it's advancing uh, science or it's, you know, nuclear reactors, uh, uh, nuclear energy, uh, and so on. It's a wonderful, wonderful things. Chemicals, plastics, how lucky we are to have plastics, you know. I mean, can you, how did people live before there were plastics? But the, uh, I mean, these, the, the, the issues that are raised by a reconsideration of industrial progress and human cost in the 19th century are really the same issues, you know, that exist today when you consider the economy. The economy has to be seen in class terms. This is, they, don't want, they do not want us to see the United States in class terms. Uh, when Bush said that, and that was a very serious statement by Bush, you know, and of course, Dukakis, whom he was accusing, I thought, what, Dukakis is arousing class conflict? Uh, 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 I looked upon Dukakis in a new, fresh way. <laughs> 
I'm sure he was surprised. <laughs> and if he had ever even hinted in any of the statements that there was something like a class system in the United States, and I doubt that he did, I'm sure he immediately retracted the statement. You see. Um, but there's a, an, a, the lessons of, of history, the, the story of class struggle and class division in American history is something that is extremely important if we are to uh, look uh, perceptively, uh, look understandably, look meaningfully at the kinds of things that are being discussed today where the attempt is, uh, as always, to present the nation as one nation, one community, one family, the Constitution, the preamble, we the people of the United States, as if we, the people of the United States, created the Constitution and not 55 rich white men, no Indians, no blacks, no women. Uh, we, the people of the United States, it's all one big happy family. I mean, that's what, that's what war is about. War, war, war is a wonderful way of, of covering up all the differences. We're all in this together, right? Exxon and us. You know, uh, we have a, a common interest. I mean, that's what patriotism is. Uh, the creation of a common interest, uh, the artificial creation of a common interest. And so the, the, the language that suffuses politics uh, is devoid of class content. So they talk about taxation, they talk about spending, without any notion, without any suggestion that there's a, a class element to this. And so they, they'll talk about, well, the liberals want to tax and spend, then the liberals uh, get excited. Liberals are very excitable people <laughs> and uh, sensitive people. And say, no, 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 we're not for taxing any more than you are. Uh, we're not for spending any more than you are. We're not for peace any more than you are. We're not for anything any more than you are, <laughs> except winning the election which we are for more than you are, you see. Uh, but I haven't seen any candidate, anybody running, saying taxation is a class issue. Yes, let's tax. Let's not be afraid to say, talk about taxation. Yes, we need to tax, tax, tax. Not the poor, not the middle class. Tax the rich, tax the super rich, tax the corporations, you know. You know, the cor corporations in the United States pay an average tax of 15%. Some of them pay 5%. Some of them pay 0%. If you have a good enough accountant, you can pay 0%, you see. In Japan, they tax the corporations 40%. You notice how that has hurt their economy <laughs> terribly? <laughs> no. oh, yeah. And you notice how since Reagan uh, lowered the tax rate on the rich and corporations, how our economy has boomed, <laughs> you say. Uh, but you know, by, uh, even a small surtax on the super rich of 5% would, would generate 60, 70 billion dollars. 10 sur percent surtax would generate 140, 150 billion dollars a year. Uh, but that's only the beginning. It is possible by uh, uh, just taxation, uh, and without reducing everybody to the same level, we mustn't do that, <laughs> right? And people, as soon as, as soon as you want to tax the, uh, if you, as soon as you want to tax the multimillionaires, you're accused of wanting to bring any, everybody down to the same level, you see. But how about halfway down? <laughs> you know, you know, uh, But taxation is looked upon you know, without any consideration of who you're taxing. Spend, again, oh no, we, we, we don't want to be caught spending. Why not? Why not spend? But it's, it's, there again, it's a question of what are you spending for? And who are you benefiting by your spending? You know, are you spending to bail out the banks? Are you spending to bail out the insurance companies? Are you spending to make sure that the people who have deposits of over $100,000 are taken care of? Uh, uh, are you spending to keep Chrysler in business? Uh, are you spending, in other words, the way the government has always been spending? And that is to help the 
help the, the richest elements of the society. Right? We've always had a welfare state before they talked about it as a welfare state. We started from the very beginning of this country giving welfare to the rich, to the bankers, to the merchants, uh, with tariffs, with uh, 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 partnerships and banking between the United States and, and the National Bank, uh, with uh, subsidies and subsidies and subsidies. It was a subsidy uh, here in San Francisco giving to, given to the maritime industry, which is one of the causes of, of indignation among the maritime workers here uh, and led to the great San Francisco strike of 1934 and the general strike of 1934 in San Francisco uh, as these, the, sh the uh, marine workers, the sailors, the longshoremen, the dock workers uh, became aware of, of the conditions they were living under and the fact that the government uh, was giving money uh, to, the, to the industry and had been for some time. So, uh, to look upon these things in class terms, look upon taxation, spending, the, the, the welfare state. Uh, uh, if, you, if you talk about taxation in, in class terms and talk about spending in class terms and say what you're going to spend for and say you're going to spend to take care of people, you're going to spend, take that money uh, that, that, that we are getting out of uh, uh, taxing the, the super rich and the corporations and take the money that is being, uh, uh, that is being spent for these uh, absurd weapons, hundreds of billions of dollars for that, uh, then we could spend the money to have a, a free health care system for everybody and free housing for everybody who needs it. And no problem of food for anybody who needs food. Uh, no problem of the basic necessities of life uh, for people who need them. No problem of, of uh, guaranteeing jobs uh, for people who need work. No problem of, of daycare uh, in families where daycare is needed. N none of that. Uh, so I'm suggesting that the, that the history, the, the hidden history of class, of labor and capital, if you don't mind me using words like that, <laughs> you see. But the hidden history of that in this country, the history uh, that, that uh, George Bush and, and all of his club members you know, want to uh, obliterate uh, is exactly the kind of history you know which we should uh, reconstruct and and remember you know and and bring forward uh, thanks